design doesn't belong to one discipline. Design is an interdisciplinary science where you combine mechanical engineering, electronics, computer science, physics, chemistry and so on. Uh, we do have a wide variety of uh, labs in the department which uh, give the students training on what are the essential elements that are required for design. In other words, we wanted to bring the joy of engineering. There are two things in this. One is we wanted to give the fundamentals of design as an undergraduate program and then bring domain knowledge to the postgraduate program. Straight away go to the applications and teach the practice of design through an applied design process or product. The students have to spend an entire semester in the industry and with this they are able to integrate their learnings with industrially relevant problems. The actual process of creating new designs requires a special set of skills which we promote in our department. The Institute of Eminence Scheme has been launched by the Government of India to empower higher educational institutions and help them become world-class teaching and research institutions. IIT Madras is proud to have been selected as one of the select institutes of excellence. As part of our commitment to the cause of fostering world-class research, IIT Madras has set up a number of research initiatives in diverse fields of contemporary relevance. Many of these initiatives will go on to become centers of excellence within the IIT Madras system. A total of 68 research initiatives belonging to 21 identified technology clusters are presently underway. As part of these initiatives, it is proposed to host a series of webinars from each cluster to showcase the innovative research being generated to various stakeholders like researchers, industrialists and policy makers. These webinars will give an opportunity to engage in conversation with eminent faculty from IIT Madras and other international researchers and also to find more collaboration in those research areas. So why wait? Click the link below to be a part of this. has been privileged to host many international students from all over the world. Most of these students come for their exchange programs to either do their coursework, research work or their thesis for a period of six months to one year. I came here with a lot of doubt about being in a different environment but a pleasure of being in this place. In all my courses I found wonderful friends who helped me and I never feel alone or being outsider. I came here to IIT Madras in searching opportunities and I've been given the opportunity to work in testing the main sensor of the, of the satellite. This is just one of the biggest big projects that IIT Madras is holding now a days and I'm really happy to have chosen this, this opportunity to come here. The campus is an amazing place, there's so much to do. If you want to do some sports, there are many options. If you're hungry, you can find several food stalls, choose bars and cafes at each corner. The library is a good choice if you want to do some work done, especially when the weather is getting too hot. Let's do great things together. Now, the mouse brain in terms of evolution principles is relatively simple. Now, the human brain will be a lot more complex than this. It's a lot more area and a lot more denser area, lighter areas and so on and so forth. So, the Center of Computational Brain Research at IIT Madras uh, is designed in a way where we, we form the interface between uh, biology and engineering. Talking about engineering, in spirit, most computers even today rely on the architecture laid out by Von Neumann in 1945. And the problem with that is it's almost impossible to make computers any more faster than what we have already achieved today by making smaller and smaller transistors. But the study of the human brain enables the possibility of an altogether new kind of computer modeled on the brain itself. That's the future.
Hello and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the Office of Global Engagement, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 26th webinar from the IRS webinar series. My name is Richu George Phillip and I'm a part of the Office of Global Engagement. From the Energy Propulsion and Renewables Technology Cluster, the research initiative presenting today is Advanced Gas Turbine Engines led by Professor T.M. Murganandam. Professor Murganandam did his B.Tech and M.S. in Aerospace Engineering at IIT Madras. He then went to Stanford University Mechanical Engineering for an M.S. where he learned spectroscopic diagnostics. He did his Ph.D. in Aerospace Engineering from Georgia Tech USA where he worked on combustor flame stability and combustion diagnostics. After that, he joined Aerospace Department IIT Madras as a faculty member and has been here ever since. He has been working on diagnostics in combustion and high-speed flows. He is a part of NCCRD and MHRD Center for Non-Intrusive Diagnostics. He is now the principal coordinator of this IOE research initiative. He has guided 20 research scholars, authored over 35 international journal papers, over 85 international conference papers. He has five patents, two of which have been commercialized. Joining us as the moderator today is Professor Tim Lewin. Dr. Tim Lewin is a Regents Professor, the David S. Lewis Junior Professor, and the Executive Director of the Strategic Energy Institute at Georgia Tech. In this capacity, he manages Georgia Tech's overall strategy and external relations for its 120 million per year energy portfolio. He's also founder and CTO of Turbine Logic, an analytics firm working in the energy industry. Professor Tim is an international authority on clean energy and propulsion, and his work has contributed to numerous commercialized innovations in the energy and aerospace sector. He has authored four books and over 400 other publications. Current and past board positions include governing advisory boards for Oak Ridge National Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and the National Renewable Energy Lab, appointed by the DOE Secretary to the National Petroleum Council and board member of the ASME International Gas Turbine Institute. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of ASME, APS, and AIAA, and foreign fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. Major awards include the AIAA Lawrence Perry Award, AIAA Pendry Award, and ASME's George Westinghouse Gold Medal. We also have many of our IITM faculty on the panel today. Thank you to each and every one of you for being with us today. Also extending a warm welcome to the GE team that's here with us. We're very glad that you could be a part of the webinar and uh, you know be a part of the research initiative. So before we start, a uh, note to the participants, please use the Q&A to enter your questions and upload questions that interest you so that the moderator can prioritize them later. Over to you, Professor Murgandam. Thank you, Richu. I'll share the screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, Center of Excellence on Advanced Gas Turbine Engine Technologies. Uh, uh, apparently, Kamlesh Hatwa is not currently able to join us, it looks like. So I can cover for him, not a problem. I would like to start with uh, thanking our chairman, moderator, Professor Tim Lewin again for agreeing to join us here. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, Okay, this is our team. Uh, I am having this screen, I have to collapse. Okay. Okay, so this is our team. There are like around 10 people in here. Uh, three of us are aerospace department. Uh, that's me and this uh, Satya Chakravarti, Tim Luen also knows him. Uh, Nagbushan Rao, we three are aerospace department. There is uh, Kritika, Sesad Vishek, and uh, Piyush Shakya. They are from mechanical engineering department. Uh, Satya Seshadri and Arul Prakash are from applied mechanics. And uh, Kamle Hatwa and Krishna Vasudevan are from electrical engineering department. So it's a multidisciplinary program as it is supposed to be for a gas turbine engine. So I am not going to go into details of this slide. I just want to show here that there was a survey conducted around 2015 which showed that. Uh, Unless we do something about uh, uh, carbon emission, CO2 emission, it's going to be pretty bad. That's the main idea of this. But uh, I'd like to show that aviation has been uh, 
handling 2% of this global carbon emissions uh, for, uh, for contributions and uh, from here if we don't do anything it's supposed to follow this particular curve up to 2050 at uh, if we modify the fuel that is being used in the engine then it may be flattened out if we use something like cng then it may get flattened out like this and then if we go for some other fuels alternate fuels uh, probably try and use hydrogen based fuels these things will bring it down even lower and we will hope that we can get to 50 percent of our current state uh, that's the idea that's given by this particular plot so there is a continuous race for uh, achieving carbon footprint uh, among the gas turbine industries uh, if you look at it they're all uh, telling that they'll use uh, some kind of alternate fuels or use hydrogen blends uh, and then they say like by 2035 they'll have engines operating with hydrogen blends and maybe fully hydrogenized by 2050 so that's one direction that we need to push the gas turbine technologies uh, next thing is uh, everything is getting electrified nowadays right including all kinds of engines so why not gas turbine engines too so we are looking at starters for gas turbine engine instead of using compressed air for starting the shaft uh, next is uh, seal performance is uh, typically done only by computational methods now uh, we are going to go do some experimental work on that and that is the other part so what are the main changes that the industry will face if we are going to implement these uh, what we'll see is uh, we'll have to inject gas instead of liquid not a great deal but we need to think about how it works it's not the same spray nozzle uh, if we have hydrogen it's going to have higher temperature higher flame speed burn rate will be higher heating rate will be higher all these will cause temperatures being much higher and that actually means that uh, you need to have better thermal management and uh, one more thing that will happen with the higher heat release rate would be like your work output per kilogram of fuel will be higher which means the cycle will be different it may end up with higher pressure and higher rpm for the whole gas turbine engine operation and then we need to worry about the seals uh, should be able to operate at higher heating rate and at higher rpm so these are all things that we need to worry about next thing is uh, if we have to have a startup that's at a gas turbine engine starter then we need to worry about uh, uh, one good thing is we you know we will have less core air being used but we need to think about uh, how are we going to manage this what am i going to do with it while it is not being operated all that will be taken care of in this we are thinking that it will decrease the number of components uh, in the gas turbine engine the four verticals in this particular gas turbine initiative that we are having are uh, first thing would be the gas turbine combustor the predominant effect of uh, in, in making it hydrogen uh, blend or pure hydrogen that will be studied here uh, next would be to handle the heat that's generated it will be like heat transfer as well as waste heat recovery that will be done in this uh, uh, vertical b then there is uh, vertical c that is on high temperature high speed seals uh, that will be handling what's happening inside the engine inside here and then there is uh, starters which are going to be either working as a starter or as a generator that's the idea of that particular vertical and then uh, overall goal through all of this is to work as close to realistic conditions as possible while maintaining academic rigor so we'll go into details of each of these uh, first vertical is uh, combustor technology and uh, here we are going to say that we'll generate some combustor configurations which will work with hydrogen or hydrogen hydrocarbon blends or probably alternating alternate fuels like uh, saf etc with uh, making sure that we have low emissions uh, very good operability and durability of uh, operation all that along with uh, we have to now be able to test this combustor so we create a rig like this which has like high temperature air incoming at reasonable pressures uh, so we are creating a test condition chamber where we will just have this test combustor which can be just plugged in and tested that kind of configuration is what we are envisioning right now and uh, we will have to have a blending station outside which will blend the fuel if it is going to be hydrogen hydrocarbon blending system and then we have to also make sure that we have continuous uh, uh, flow of at least one kilogram per second 10 bar 600 kelvin air that's supplied along with whatever equivalence ratio air fuel ratios that are supposed to be done for each of the tests for the particular combustor while we are putting that in there we have to use advanced uh, laser diagnostics uh, like piv chemiluminescence etc in there and 
we are also going to have more models being updated for uh, hydrogen hydrogen blends etc up to higher pressures than what even can achieve with this uh, things. okay the deliverables for this vertical would be uh, that particular rig which is a plug and test kind of uh, rig with uh, as close to industry conditions as possible and then we will also arrive at some few configurations for combustor up to trl level 2 to 3 kind of situation and uh, we will get a lot of benchmark data which can be used to modify combustion models if necessary and after the first phase that is two years after that when we go to future we are planning to establish the full center in the research campus which is outside uh, iit madras current campus and then we will establish a full facility with higher than 10 bar pressure higher than 10 kilogram one kilogram per second and try and achieve up to 800 kelvin temperature of air supply and in the future we expect that we will have collaborations from other power generation gas turbine industries or maybe this combustion model will be of course it should be useful for all the other uh, power and automotive industry as well you go to next generation uh, heat exchangers uh, here we will uh, find that this is required primarily because of the high temperature that is produced by the hydrogen combustion and so we need to have an advanced cooling system because the heat release rate is going to be higher and uh, so we are planning to use this supercritical co2 based uh, uh, cooling devices and uh, we will generate new uh, next generation heat exchangers which are all going to use uh, uh, supercritical co2 as the coolant uh, you can see some of the coupons that are on the left here uh, which are basically showing this is the kind of thing that we are planning on doing and uh, phase one deliverables will be first create a test rig where we can test this then while that is going on we will be developing some coupons for uh, heat exchangers test that hydraulically as well as uh, heat transfer wise and then all this is done by additive manufacturing and then we'll go take this knowledge go into prototype development and then we'll go and check whether our prototype is working well we'll go and test it at full scale testing this is the goal and after the first phase uh, we are planning on extending it to waste heat recovery using this uh, sco2 cycle uh, you can see on the left and then we can also add organic rank and cycle to the bottom of it to make it even more efficient and then uh, we are hoping that uh, we will also make some contributions in the uh, supercritical co2 uh, turbines and compressor design as you can see in the bottom there's some work going on uh, after all this we are thinking that there will be future collaborations which will come up in terms of heat exchangers and heat pump design and all that and uh, this will be useful for oil gas power industries uh, and also be uh, useful for turbine and compressor manufacturing next is uh, on seals performance this is a third vertical here the technology that we are going to look at is actually can we evaluate the seals very well and for this we need to have a test rig this is the rare thing that's happening around the world there's not many rigs that are available uh, and so we need to have a rig where we can test this at close to reality conditions so we are going to have high pressure high temperature air that's coming in inside and then we are going to test this particular air going through the seals at the close to actual rpms conditions so the typical rig would look something like this uh, as you can see the seals are around here my mouse doesn't seem to work suddenly okay so the seals are around here this is what is depicted is actually a simple labyrinth seal kind of uh, depiction so some seal like this the air that's coming in is going to go through this uh, through very small gaps and that's what it is supposed to see that's the idea so uh, we are trying to have uh, cfd models of course people have already done work on that there's a lot of literature on cfd work uh, the main thing is we will generate some seals and then we'll go put it in there test it and see if it performs well at these conditions and then that will also go into model data what are the challenges it's actually high speed rotor high temperature high pressure and clearances are very very small okay these are the typical challenges so we have to be able to assemble this very well without damaging the seals and then test them while testing we are going to actually actuate this uh, stator units which are going to change the clearance between the stator and the rotating seal and uh, that is actually the crucial thing we need to check and then uh, it's supposed to be creating instabilities etc and then uh, we have to measure what is the actual force that is generated in the rotor uh, based on some particular set of instrumentation which we need to carefully align in there that's the challenge in this particular ring 
So we'll try and make this rig in the first phase, in the first two years itself, at uh, close to uh, pressure, high pressure and temperature conditions. And we also, there is some parallel work going on in CFD, as you can see on the left. I don't want to get into that right now, so I want of time. Uh, we'll say that we will try and reduce the uh, rotodynamic forces in seals and try to give some particular configurations which are useful for these conditions of operation for the future uh, next generation engines. Okay. Uh, this particular capability will actually be uh, promoted into the CFD uh, version as well after the data is given. And then we will hope we will get uh, engine manufacturers to see that it will give you fuel economy and weight reduction. Okay. Uh, I am assuming that uh, Kamlesh Atua is not there, so I am continuing into this particular part. Uh, vector, this particular aspect is like uh, electrifying the starter generator uh, for the uh, uh, gas turbine engine. So typically, we will use uh, compressed air for starting the engine. Instead, now we are going to have batteries, which will be converting uh, that battery energy will be converted by a converter into a AC, which is going to drive a AC uh, motor which is going to run the shaft initially. But once the engine starts operating and starts giving shaft power, that's going to be converted into a generator instead of a starter motor. And then that will produce electricity, which is now going to be converted back to DC and stored in batteries or supplied to the aircraft uh, in terms of, uh, say, a primary power distribution system that's present there. Uh, the voltages are given out here. So, And then uh, this primary power, uh, this thing uh, is supposed to have some variable frequency, we'll just ignore that for now. Uh, they are using silicon carbide based uh, inverters inside there, which is supposed to give uh, uh, higher energy efficiency and give uh, very good uh, compactness inside the circuit. And then uh, if you look at the maximum generator speed that they are targeting, it's around 20,000 RPM. Targeted uh, system efficiency is supposed to be more than 90%. Uh, in the first phase, they are going to work with uh, uh, just devise, make the technology architecture, design the whole thing and uh, go only on paper design, but test it to simulation wise and then go all the way up to TRL3. And then after that, after the first two years, first phase, they'll go into prototype development and then test it, extend it all the way up to TRL5. That is, they do repeated tests in there. And then we'll hope that this particular technology will be taken up into the engine. And uh, in that case, it may also be useful for the other sectors based on this particular architecture, other air transport sectors may also be using. Uh, we have a major uh, collaboration partner that's GE. Uh, they are uh, GE Aviation from uh, Global Research Campus, Bangalore, India. They are interested in all the four verticals as of now, and uh, they have uh, given support in several sense, in sense, like they are giving direct cash contribution for supporting student hiring and also operational budget. And uh, they are also giving in-kind contribution in terms of design support and also fabrication support for some of the special fabrications. Opportunities for others, uh, there will be webinar series for dissemination of information. Uh, there will be internships that are possible in the center. There will be collaborative efforts that are possible with other universities if others are interested. There is uh, International uh, collaborations wise, I'm going to say that there will be webinars which we'll be organizing after this further. And then there will be uh, other collaborative efforts which will be encouraged. There is a new thing that our director has introduced is this Eng International Faculty. Uh, this is like somebody who is currently at a postdoc level and they're interested in joining a faculty job in the center that they can do and they're paid reasonably well in the center. Uh, and then there is also student exchange programs with uh, different universities that is also welcome for these centers. This is the last slide I have. Uh, I just want to say that this is a unique center which has all these key technologies uh, which are needed to push the gas turbines into a new regime. And uh, I'll just say that there are four verticals. Each of them individually can be in, uh, industry oriented and several industries may be having spin-offs from these technologies and they can use it. Other than that, uh, there is also models developed which can also be useful for future predictive capabilities. And uh, we will have some test beds uh, where we can test most of the things at uh, uh, close to full scale conditions. And we, we may have it in the new campus at even higher conditions for phase two. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, now we can go into questions mode. Uh, 
so so Murgy, are others going to give talks or is now where I start moderating? Oh, yeah, yeah. it's now it's your turn. The, uh, the, uh, Dr. Kamri Hatua couldn't join, it looks like. I talked for him as well. So. Oh, okay, great. Um, so what I should do now is just um, for the remaining, I guess, 35 minutes, have a moderated Q&A with the attendees. Yep, I guess so. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you um, for the invite. This is a really exciting program. Um, I enjoyed the video. I've, I have been on the IITM campus, I guess, two times. And I had, uh, well, I had hoped to be there last year, but uh, with COVID, it didn't work out. COVID. But, um, I have I have deep respect for the Institute uh, and um, all the partners on this on this call. And um, and this is a really exciting um, initiative and consortium. So I'm, I'm delighted to just be learning a little bit about it as well and, and to hear this nice presentation from Professor Morgan Andam about it. So what I'll, I guess what we'll do is um, you will see in the chat, there is opportunities to ask questions. What I'm, I have, I have some of my own questions and I'm gonna, so I'm gonna be answering some of these, asking some of these questions and then maybe merging some of these and asking some of my own. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll start with, with this question uh, around sort of hybridization. So you know, you've talked a little bit about hybridization around electrification, but there's also a question around hybridization with, um, with fuel cells. Um, can you just talk a little bit about where and how, or whether that's in scope, or whether you guys have thought about fuel cell integration and, and so forth? Okay, currently, uh, I have, we are not working on the batteries part of the problem. We are working on the uh, portion after the batteries. So, so fuel cells will be sitting out there, right, in the fuel uh, battery side. We are looking at the architecture after the battery till the shaft rotating. That portion is what we, uh, we are focusing on in this particular center. I believe there are other centers in this uh, center of excellence, uh, Institute of Eminence schemes itself. There are uh, centers that are working on batteries development. So we will leave it to them, I think. Uh, uh, but I guess it's if it is energy efficient and compact enough, we will plan on using that as well. Yeah, and I think the spirit of the question was there's some there's been some work on the on integration of fuel cells and um, gas turbines to get higher efficiencies than either can do on their own. Um, I think that was the question. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll, so sure I'll move to that. this question. Um, just on how, talk a little bit more about how you're recovering the heat energy, um, you know, with, with, these, with these concepts. Uh, this is uh, related to the Thermal management, is it? Is that the question? Or yeah. is it bad uh, let, let, me, let me take that question. Uh, in terms of heat recovery, as I saw in the Q&A, there were a couple of uh, points on uh, thermoelectric systems and other kinds of uh, opportunities. So the state of the art of thermoelectric uh, does not really allow us to recover much of the energy. So the more uh, commonly employed uh, techniques are the organic ranking cycle based systems. And one of the key challenges for that in terms of uh, markets such as India, where the ambient temperatures are fairly high, is the low efficiency. So that's where supercritical CO2 is being uh, looked upon as one of the working fluids, both for heat recovery from the exhaust and also on thermal management of the uh, high temperature uh, uh, secondary cooling uh, because of the combustion of hydrogen. So I think uh, though we are agnostic to looking at other options, but it appears like uh, SCO2 is one of those areas that's getting fairly good amount of traction in terms of both turbine cooling and also on heat recovery systems. Uh, here's an, actually, here's another thermal management question just around transpor transpiration cooling um, and using some of the fuel. Um, is that a viable method for, for getting to higher temperatures. And maybe if you can just chat a little bit about that. And I guess a little bit like what it's done in, in, in rocket, rocket systems. Okay. Yeah, uh, Murugananda, do you want to take it? Yeah, I'll take it. As in like, uh, if we have fuel, especially hydrogen uh, burning very close to the wall, I think uh, it will increase the temperature near the wall. That may not be a yes. good thing. Yes, so, of course it is. Well, let me stop you. The, the, the question yeah. is more around thermal management that, you know, right now hydrogen is used in power stations for cooling. Um, it's, you know, any, any, you know, most gas turbine power plants or coal power plants 
use hydrogen already today. They don't burn it, they just use it for cooling because of its specific heat. Um, so I think the question was more focused around the use of hydrogen, use, use of the fuel itself as part of the cooling scheme and thermal management scheme. Okay, it's not used as transpiration then, right? You're telling it's like used as in rocket engines, just uh, along the wall, not transpiration. No, Murgi, this is more towards the secondary cooling, the turbine, uh, the blade cooling holes and the, the secondary cooling with, where you have the compound injection of uh, cooling flow. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are not really sure if hydrogen is something that can be used inside of uh, gas turbine blades for secondary cooling. Uh, if that that was the question, uh, if I may, I think if, if I got it right. Is that supposed to be in the turbine? Then it could be dangerous also, right? Uh, so there are there are secondary cooling holes in the turbines uh, where you do inject, uh, as I said, uh, compressed air or any other uh, cold air uh, to uh, uh, get the temperatures of the turbine blades lower than the melting point. Close. I mean, these are secondary holes that are inside all over the turbine blades. So in that particular holes, uh, sometimes you can use the fuel itself to cool because if you utilize any other fluid, you are introducing non-condensable, non-combustible gases. So um, there's some some amount of work that's done on introducing fuel itself for cooling. But at this point in time, the way we are looking at it is using supercritical CO2 as a moderator because supercritical CO2 also has similar high heat capacity and it can do fairly effective cooling. And that has been shown in many uh, recent uh, amount of uh, studies. So that's that's one of the areas that we're exploring because it's also safer to handle. Great. Uh, let me shift gears away from a technical question, which is a number of questions around internships and how people can get in, get involved. Can you can you guys talk about how people can get internships? Uh, internships will be, uh, you have to contact us uh, directly as in the professors, you just drop an email and uh, when the position opens up, we'll just uh, tell you initial, we are currently in the initial phase, right? Just uh, maybe in two, three months, we'll have enough stuff to do. And then you'll, we can distribute it to some interns and there can be internships so, possible. So there, there are two, in addition to that, there is one more, uh, more uh, standardized process where every year IIT Madras offers this summer research fellowships for undergraduate students from other institutes other than IIT. So it is a nationwide process. So you can also look out for those processes where we will also be having a couple of projects in that pool as well. So there are two opportunities. One is you directly write to us and as and when the uh, projects and projects get on board, we will be picking up a few. And there is a standard summer research internship, which is a, for a period of about three months, uh, which you can uh, participate uh, in during the vacation period next year. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, obviously this is a gas turbine focus, but are there going to be, um, I guess, are you guys going to be thinking about some other propulsion applications like scramjets or supersonic devices? I do scramjet studies. Uh, that may not be coming under this uh, center, I think. Uh, we do supersonic combustion studies in our lab, but that is not related to this. Uh, we are having a transparent supersonic combustion rig in our uh, facility in the NCCRD. Uh, that's not related to the gas turbines focus, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about kind of the, the tech. You talked, you used word TRL5 and, and, you know, kind of tech transfer and things like that. Can you talk a little bit more now about the um, kind of your strategy, you know, where and how GE will be engaged and some other partners because, uh, you know, there's some questions here around just, you know, clearly India has a long, very distinguished history in gas turbine development. Uh, but, you know, just the idea of, of actually seeing these, these innovations making it into the marketplace. Okay, I think uh, Mayur will be a better person to take that question. Is Mayur around? I just want... Yeah, hi, uh, Professor Murugi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so first of all, uh, congratulations to the IIT team, uh, you know, for taking this step, and uh, thank you for inviting us and you know having us as a collaborators in this. Um, so uh, we've been uh, working with IIT on multiple uh, projects through this, uh, you know, over the last few years, and uh, our engagement has been to basically um, uh, advance the understanding of technology and then 
uh, work so collaboratively so that we are able to get some of this technology into our products. And that's what we, our uh, focus will be uh, as we look on uh, um, uh, developing these technologies in future. G recently announced uh, you know, a huge goal on sustainability and uh, through its uh, RISE programs. And we would be looking to you know, um, um, support IIT in the best way we can um, to make sure that some of these technologies are uh, ready for uh, an industrialization uh, standpoint. So uh, really looking for IITs uh, uh, to take this forward. And you know, we are there to support and help as best as we can through our uh, engineering center in Bangalore. Are there? Are there, in, I guess, have you maybe talk a little bit about some of the internships and, and um, will students be working at in Bangalore, um, you know, as part of the center or will there be summer internships or things like that? Yeah, uh, so the idea is that, uh, uh, I mean, from our standpoint, I think it's primarily the students working in uh, Chennai uh, in the IIT campus. Um, and we would be uh, happy to have them uh, work with our team and, and visit our Bangalore site uh, as needed. Uh, but primarily, I think the action happens in IIT. Okay, great. Let me, uh, okay, so let me move back to some, some um, more technical questions. Maybe let's just talk about the hydrogen itself, where it's coming from. Are you, are you looking at, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Maybe just talk about: Are you looking at onboard hydrogen production, or would it would you be just be taking I don't know cryogenic hydrogen that's that's stored on the on the plane, or or, or maybe just talk a little about the production side of things? Okay. Currently, uh, we are trying to enable the combustor technology right now. Yes. Uh, currently, uh, I believe there are these two technologies that are being talked about. One is like onboard hydrogen production. Uh, using electrical energy coming either from solar or coming from uh, uh, the engine itself, uh, which I think is detrimental. Uh, but the other aspect, uh, storing it, I think will cause more trouble. Uh, I think it should be onboard production, but uh, I'm not the expert on that right now. I'm going to create this technology so that people will think, yes, there is combustor technology. Now we just have to work on the yeah. tanks that are coming up. Yeah. But onboard production from what? What would it be coming from? Like ammonia or, or natural gas or some liquid fuel? Ammonia is a nice option, except for the NOx, if we can control it. Uh, so there is also electrolysis, yes. Oh, ammonia is like easy to store as what I hear. Sorry? Okay. You yeah. mean actually carrying water aboard the plane? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. The ammonia is also easier to carry. It also gives you some energy in the process of producing water. So, yeah, okay. Um, well, while we're talking about that, there's there's a couple of questions just on the the, the carbon. You know, one of the, the large goals of this program is is around CO two footprint reduction. Can you comment a little bit on the the carbon footprint of hydrogen production? Ah, uh, I. Uh... <laughs> I, uh, I did not do the calculations on this particular thing, but I feared that there will be such a question coming up and it came up, uh, I'll just say. Uh, so let me, let me add sure that in, in terms of the economics as of now in India, uh, the green hydrogen production is at anywhere between 800 to 900 rupees per kg, uh, which would be about what? Uh, $15 per kg, 15 to $20 per kg, uh, not on green hydrogen, that's on black hydrogen. Black hydrogen is from coal. So as of now, it, since it's mostly an industrial fuel, it's mostly reformed at the site, uh, specifically uh, somewhere near the steel mills and the place where it's being used. Uh, we have not had such a big hydrogen infrastructure, but the, the government's uh, hydrogen energy targets are to get uh, green hydrogen to anywhere between four to $5 per kg uh, within the next uh, two to three years. That's the target with these mega electrolyzer kind of projects. So with that, uh, in, in terms of propulsion, given the uh, lack of availability of natural gas in India, hydrogen as a fuel for gas turbine would already be attractive for at least peaker plants and stationary gas turbine uh, technologies. For aviation, I think uh, it, it does require a lot more work because of the uh, 
issues with regards to storage and other things. But I think uh, the midterm pathway for hydrogen economy here, it's been looked upon is about three to four dollars per kg, which would offer land-based gas turbines as one of the option. And you could already see that happening because there are quite a few, uh, what do you call as big petrochemical owning companies trying to set up large, huge uh, megawatt scale electrolyzers. An electrolyzer is already being looked upon as one of those technologies for a gigafactory, which is going to be set up uh, probably in the large numbers in the coming years. Well, that, that was great. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the heat exchanger, you know, the supercritical CO2 heat exchanger. Um, there, there's a question here around, you know, there, there's some, been some discussion around the, the alarm cycle, which uses oxy fuel combustion and, you know, for, for ground power applications. Um, in fact, there's, a, I think, a few demonstrators that are being built globally. So have you thought about kind of those types of concepts and where and how those might integrate with, with the gas turbine? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we have uh, not really investigated much into it. We have uh, heard about and looked into the alum cycle, although uh, rather cursorily. Uh, there are quite a few oxy fuel based uh, systems that are being looked upon. So. At this point in time, we have not really looked upon it in depth to comment on the viability or non-viability of such cycles, but would definitely be of interest as we move forward in the next phase of the project. In the first phase, we are primarily looking at the early stages of SCO2 integration. Uh, one of the key technology pieces that we are trying to validate is utilization of additive manufacturing as a method for handling SCO2 because uh, additive manufacturing has so far been mostly deployed in uh, low pressure applications. Whereas with SCO2, you do end up with fairly high pressure. So that's one of the key elements that we are looking to validate. But I think uh, in the next phases of the project, this certainly would be uh, of interest for our uh, grouping here. Uh, Satya, Satya, we have experience with high pressure, additively manufactured, high temperature. Uh, okay. Thing. We've been doing that in Agnikul and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I think moderate pressures with the GE project that we do, like about three, four bar, but Plan to do up to about 70 bar combustion with uh, inconal uh, 3D. Inconal based materials. Okay. okay. Um, sounds good. Actually, uh, another question popped up. You know, you talked about sort of the, the engagement of this program with industry, but, you know, there's also sort of the regulatory side of and getting regulatory approval from the organization. So have you talked about or thought about, you know, or had conversations with you know Indian regulatory agencies that would actually have to approve these these concepts for flight. Uh, Maybe I have I... not done it, Satya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chakravarti, yeah. Right. So uh, no, I think our our regulatory agencies actually follow what either FAA or EASA do. They don't really necessarily do something that's other than what FAA or EASA do. Um, if they have to do this, uh, they will probably will have to do separate tests. And I think in our country, we have better, uh, what do you call, uh, line of sight to getting it um, certified by the military certification agency, Semilac, more than the civil certification agency. So I think the, the first point of uh, call would be to work with the FAA. Got right. it. So Tim, maybe you can help us with that. Thank you. You bet. No, it's an interesting problem. Um, there's a question here. I'm, I'm just going to read it out loud. Um, it says, do we generally do water flow tests on supersonic gas turbine rotors? If done, is there any history available on breakage of blades due to cavitation? Um, I'm not take up to do answer this question. Maybe uh, not motion. Probably uh, not. I don't think we'll do that. I don't know who will be able to answer that. I'm not sure of that uh, water flow test on supersonic gas turbine rotors. Uh, I, uh, I'm not aware of any such test, uh, you know, like uh, only only for uh, the aircraft, you know, like I'm aware of any of these kind of tests, but uh, uh, not of, uh, I'm not aware of any tests being done, uh, say, in most of this uh, Indian manufacturing companies uh, for this. You know, like water, water impinging there. You know, like and, and any issues of cavities in that context. Yeah. Uh, maybe like GE has more. Uh, you know, they do the all the tests, right? Uh, we use the designs or something, but yeah, they do the tests. Uh, if they have anything to comment on, like they can.
but as far as i'm aware like uh, I'm, i'm i'm not aware of it okay um let's uh, let's go back to this discussion of partners and collaboration we've talked about industry we just talked about regulatory what about sort of international collaboration um obviously there's a lot going on in japan in europe um the united states yeah, and the us what's yeah. what's what's kind of that strategy or plan for collaborations and are there exchanges planned and things like that there is plan for exchange programs uh, uh, we will just come back to you, tim and also go to jackie o'connor and maybe go to japan guys as well so well santosh shanbog is on the call so you want to probably include him <laughs> santosh shanbog is on the call oh, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. he's been asking question or oh, he is the one who asked that uh, alum yeah. cycle question right yeah. Yeah, I'll include uh, Santosh. Wait, uh, well. Tim, the the quick the quick answer is we will just tap the Georgia Tech mafia. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get, here's another question. I guess you talk. I think the test article you're developing is 12 bar, if I remember that correctly. Um, and you know, modern flight engines are you know civil at least are you know running at 50, 50 plus atmospheres. Can you just talk a little bit about how you are thinking about kind of scaling the physics and and what that what that looks like for you know the the obviously 12 bar is a, is a pretty impressive facility but moving from there to the even more extreme conditions of modern civilian flight engines Yeah uh basically uh we are uh, yes the we agree that the actual conditions are much higher pressures uh there are two constraints one is uh, we can do only this much in first phase when we go to the second phase maybe we'll uh, go to aspire to go to higher pressures uh, second thing is diagnostics uh, we can be very confident only up to up to maximum 10 bar and beyond that uh, plif based data reduction is going to be uh, fishy in some sense like the all the lines are going to be broader and that's going to become more difficult to pinpoint specific details inside that diagnostic so these are constraints right now but uh, there are people who have done work all the way up to 20 bar and reported that yes we have measured concentration at that condition etc so we will push up to 20 bar eventually when we go to the uh, second phase uh, but uh, beyond that if we want to push it to 50 bar 60 bar that's going to be only through modeling i think uh, that's going to become uh, much more industry oriented testing i believe yeah. uh, what about okay so that's the combustor what about the 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 heat exchangers the seals maybe talk a little bit about how the what conditions are we running at relative to where you think they'll be and how you'll scale from one from lab to to the engine so the seals can operate uh, as of now up to 600 kelvin and 10 bar as per the current uh, capacity of NCCRD air supply. Uh, when we go to the outside campus, we can push it to higher temperatures easily. Higher pressures also will be done, a uh, little bit up to 20 bar, etc. Uh, that I think is reasonable for the seals area. We will be in the ballpark in that condition. Um, what is the second thing you said? The, the heat exchanger. Uh, there is already higher pressure inside. If we go to higher pressures outside. Uh, uh, currently i think uh, we can push it only up to 10 bar in our capacity but we can go all the way up to 35 bar uh, in nccrd if we push it a little bit more uh, satya you have uh, satya seshadri you have plans uh, for the external pressure being higher the co2 is going to be up to 150 bar at the external yeah. pressure so oh, i think uh, as of now we are only looking at uh, the high pressure co2 heat exchangers uh, but other than that uh, no additional plans as of now so as of now it will only be up to 10 bar air and not going to be much higher condition but murgi i mean we, 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 we can push we can, it to 35 we, bar we can we can strictly speaking go up to about 35 40 bar but for shorter duration right 35 bars is possible for short duration we yeah. can do it 40 bar 10 bar, 10 bar is actually continuously possible with the the, the new compressors that are coming up up to even 2.5 kg per second right whereas uh, uh, with with uh, 40 bar 35 20 bar we can actually go up to about 8 kg per second for about 1 minute or something one okay. minute yes yeah but uh, we don't need to probably go up to 8, 8 kg per second if it's much lower we can go for much I mean longer duration but it will not be one 
it won't be like forever that's the thing so we do have that capability so the heat exchanger part yes we can push it to higher pressure we can go all the way up to probably 35 bar which is going to put you in the ballpark anyway i think uh, i think uh, uh, a more general answer to these questions would be tim uh, we will actually do uh, the diagnostics and the experimental capability based on what we have at uh, the facilities that we have at uh, nccrd but essentially this is going to be a collaborative work with let's say ge which means that we do a lot of uh, simulate simulation work and so on that can be validated against the facility uh, capabilities that we have and then it can be applied to conditions that are more realistic uh, a little bit more than what we have so effectively we are we are looking at closer to realistic conditions that's a point okay great let me I, want shift to just, I want to just uh, dial back to that uh, previous question where we kind of left it about the international uh, collaboration. I think Murgi was beginning to say that we were we have programs for uh, uh, exchange, exchange students and exchange faculty, um, but I think it, it's also outtailed along with this uh, uh, what we call as wives, uh, which is YF, YIFs, young young international faculty, right? And um, so we are actually looking at attracting people who are even a postdoc plus uh, so that they will become like international faculty uh, in our, on our campus, right? So that's, that's a very, very active program that's as part of these centers, the, the Institution of Eminence Center of Excellence uh, programs. So uh, we have these two possibilities. One is an exchange, uh, uh, exchange visits at the level of students and faculty. The other one is the young international faculty in residence that we can actually support over here. That said, I think the international spread that we can actually achieve or not only in the US, uh, which we were joking about, uh, but we, are, we, we would be very serious about you know, really reaching out to as many people as possible. Uh, and plus we have like lots of European contacts in gas turbines as you, as you know, um, as well. And then we can actually go to people like JAXA uh, in, uh, in, in Japan and a few other Japanese universities. Um, in addition, I think in this particular uh, COE, because of GE's involvement, and GE is actually an international multinational company, which means that they have not only uh, offices in the US, but also in Germany and uh, other places, in, including India. So uh, we will also be looking at who they are really interested in bringing in uh, so that the cooperation will actually be a lot tighter with the industry, right? So that's, that's the kind of flavor that we think uh, we will be following as far as the international cooperation is concerned. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit more about hiring. Um, there's a question here on when are you planning on hiring professionals and young faculty and what's that timeline? Okay, uh, we are already hiring people who are going to work in the project. Uh, for uh, young international faculty, there is a particular procedure that we have to follow. Uh, if there is somebody interested, they can contact us and we'll start the process along with you and then we'll uh, go through the procedure as prescribed by the institute that it since it is going to be like equivalent to a faculty in the department so just to go through the regular uh, procedure as given by the institute that we will have to follow it can be done even now great um there's a question here about 3d printing as well and particularly on the seal side you know you, you talked a little about additive there's a lot of really exciting things around additive um associated with heat exchangers and with combustion and fuel injectors. What about on the seal side? Is there, is there sort of an additive plan for leveraging additive for, for better sealing strategies? Uh, Professor Sekar. Yeah. Professor Sekar? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the question had to do with, um, is there a plan to, to explore the use of additive manufacturing around seals and seal technology? I don't think so. Uh, GE can answer to that. GE? We don't have any idea of that uh, additive uh, manufacturing there. I'm hearing the uh, seals being printed on shaft uh, only now i'm not sure of that but no no i don't think you guys uh, do you guys have any no as far as my knowledge goes yeah it won't be ready manufacturing in fact the, the company specifically says that they are doing this in space vehicles 
in space vehicles. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I, I think I, I guess just the, the, the probably the takeaway is to encourage the center and the center directors to, to explore the potential of additive across all the verticals. Across all the verticals. I think is the, the, the takeaway, uh, Professor Murgy. Um, there is going to be electrical uh, version also. There is going to be additive manufacturing in there. That much. Absolutely, around. absolutely. Well, I think I'm just looking at the time here, and I guess it's about 10:50. Well, it's about 55. Oh, well, okay, in Atlanta, <laughs> yeah, it's 10:55, yeah. and we. So I think I'll turn it back over to Professor Morgan Andam to close us out. Uh, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, if you have to leave, you said you have some other uh, meetings uh, just after this, so. If you have to leave, maybe you can leave and I'll still continue answering questions in here. Uh, uh, is that what you want to do? Or oh, I'm you... sorry. I thought this session was over now. It's it's supposed to be over now. If there are some questions, we'll just still keep answering. That, that's it's fine. But uh, uh, yeah, we don't have a hard stop. Don't have much uh, but, questions know, here. Respect your so, commitments. If you would like to leave, well, I think Tim has, Tim has pretty much posed all the questions. Yes, pretty much all the questions are answered. Uh, so uh, we'll just say, uh, uh, is there any other uh, comments that's left? There is, that is all I think, uh, I guess. Uh, so thank you, Tim, for uh, uh, moderating this session. Thank you all for uh, coming for this uh, particular event and making this a success. There were a lot of participants and still there are around 100 participants out there. That's pretty good uh, turnaround. Uh, so thank you all for coming uh, over to you Richu thank you thank you Professor Murugananda thanks a lot Professor Tim for being with us today you know, it was our pleasure to host you and to have you here answering all of the questions and uh, you know being with us today thanks to the, all of the faculty from IIT Madras uh, who is with us we have a big you know panel here with us today also thank you to the GE team who is here uh, you know it's, an, it's our honor to collaborate with you and to take this initiative forward Thanks a lot again, Professor Murugananda. The I'm sure the participants really enjoyed the webinar. It was, you know, you've answered so many questions and gotten really in detail into it. So thanks a lot. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the participants. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you, Murugan. Bye, Tim. Tatcha, good to see you. Oh, bye. Yeah, good to see you. <laughs> Congratulations on the nice center, and I. And, I, and, and, and next time I see you, I hope I'll be in, uh, in Chennai. I, 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 I would love to come visit you guys again. You better come here as soon as possible. You'll see a lot of exciting things happening. There is a lot yeah, more yeah, change yeah. after you came last time. And, and bring your family here. So yes, we'll be absolutely. very glad to see them. <laughs> yep, definitely. Okay, all take your, care. All, bye -bye. all your daughters. <laughs> absolutely. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So Richu, you will stop the recording and all, right? Yeah, Narish will end the webinar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.